everybody and welcome to the Jared podcast where we bring you education and information on endometriosis and adenomyosis and tonight I'm joined by Dr. Kiva Hartley. Kiva is well known within menopause circles. She's a GP with a very strong interest in women's health and in particular menopause. So Kiva you have a clinic the menopause health clinic down in Dawkey and I know you've a vast amount of experience not just in Ireland but in Canada as well so do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in women's health? Yeah, I thought that's hard to summarize quickly, isn't it? But um, I, so I am a GP and I'm from Dublin and then I moved to Canada in 2014 and I worked in a dedicated women's health clinic and I was there by choice. And so I kind of gravitated towards that after I qualified in um, 2007. Um, I'd always loved women's health anyway, but um, anyway, I had this fabulous experience in Canada. I worked with these amazing women and we uh, we sort of saw ourselves as sitting between general practice and gynecology in the hospital. We saw a lot of complicated community-based gynecology. So women who maybe needed someone who had a level of interest in this, but not quite needing the point of gynecology or surgical input. So I really upskilled for a few years when I was there, which was fantastic, um, and developed a love of everything to do with hormones, and uh, which led me down the road working in a fertility clinic. So I worked in a beautiful big fertility clinic in Edmonton um, in northern Alberta very cold but very beautiful place Um, and then I I, I launched a menopause service when I was there as part of that clinic Um, and then when I moved home in 2019 just before the pandemic uh, I was looking for something similar which was very hard to find and I ended up working in my own clinic that was kind of the easiest route to all of this so um, so I work in uh, in Dawkey in South County Dublin. I run a, a menopause dedicated menopause service there, but I also run the complex clinic for menopause in the Rotunda Hospital. Um, and then I'm accredited to the British Menopause Society, and I do lots of teaching, which is great. And we've reached recently launched the new Menopause Society of Ireland, which is fantastic. So I'm co chair with uh, another wonderful menopause specialist called Claire Cromwell. She's down in Cork. Um, so lots of exciting things to come, I hope, in uh, in this sphere in the near future. That is fantastic. And it is great to see a service like this coming up in Ireland. And, you know, we always look to the UK and we look to different countries for guidelines and for resources. And to have something like that coming up in Ireland, that is brilliant. I'm really looking forward to that, looking forward to that as a resource. And, you know, on the podcast here and certainly people I've dealt with, I try and make sure that we have like somebody who's got a really strong personal interest and got that professional um, background as well too. And you've got that lovely mix as well. You've got real passion. And anytime I've heard you speak about your topics as well too, you know, you're, you're very driven and you're very driven to help women. And I think that's really important and it comes through as well. So in terms of what we're going to chat about this evening, I suppose menopause is a hot topic, if you'll pardon the pun. And we are bombarded <laughs> between, you know, ads for one thing and another and celebrities endorsing one thing and people telling us what we should and shouldn't be doing. But I think if we bring it back to basics, and in, in particular, you know, for those of us who are living with endometriosis or adenomyosis or both, um, can you just take us through the sort of perimenopausal and, you know, menopause and postmenopausal phase? What should women look out for? Yeah, so I think... Um, Perimenopause is probably the most interesting part of this in a way, because when we think of menopause, I think most people who've read a bit about it will think, oh, it's a lack of estrogen or it's the loss of estrogen, which it is. But the stage before that, when things are wobbling, that's perimenopause. And it isn't a lack of estrogen at that point. It's often an overproduction. So instead of your ovaries producing a nice sort of cyclical up and down like bumps in a road kind of pattern of estrogen production from cycle to cycle. Um, Then I'm laughing, Kathleen, because my kids are screaming in the background. So apologies for (laughs) for that. It's real life, isn't it? Anyway, um, there is another adult out there I should point out. So I haven't totally abandoned them. But anyway, so yeah, in perimenopause, it's like a bumpy road, but it's in in, um, pre-menopause. So when women are having nice kind of regular reproductive cycles, you'll see this kind of like, you know, up and down pattern. Then you hit perimenopause and your ovaries start to struggle a little. They don't make as many follicles. They're under a bit of pressure from your brain to try and keep on straight and narrow. And that produces this very kind of volatile situation. So you often get these spikes or estrogen surges. And as everyone, you know, who follows you will know that estrogen is really what drives a lot of endometriosis and can really stimulate those endometrial glands and stroma and those cells that are similar to endometrial cells 
And so the same is true of perimenopause. We'll often see under the influence of that, those spikes of estrogen, that surges of estrogen that can happen through perimenopause. We'll see fibroids happening. We often see heavier or more frequent periods, and we'll often see slightly worsening, not across the board, but for some women, worsening of their endometriosis symptoms, which is something I feel that probably isn't talked about a huge amount because women are aiming for, they're thinking, okay, when I get to menopause, my periods will stop, like things will improve. And then we have maybe three or 4% of women who actually continue to experience endometriosis symptoms, despite the fact that they're now post-menopausal, which means they've gone a year with no periods, a year with no bleeding for no other cause, and they're truly menopausal, but they're, yeah, three or 4% of women can continue to have some of those endometriosis symptoms. Again, something that I know it's a small percentage, but something that we don't, hear a lot about I feel yeah it is it's, it's one of those things that we've always been told and certainly people of my vintage when I was diagnosed in the sort of late 90s it was like oh you're going to get pregnant this is going to help you and then you're going to have your menopause and that's going to really help you and that'll be the end of you don't come back to the service and we now know that that isn't true we know that for some people pregnancy can actually exacerbate it you know for menopause and perimenopause it can be a very very trying time so in terms of those perimenopausal symptoms, like they're, they're vast and they're wide ranging as well. But for some members of our community, they may have had a hysterectomy due to either adenomyosis or fibroids or to even cope with that heavy bleeding. Is there anything in particular that they should be looking out for? Because when you don't have that bleeding, you don't have the trickling and flooding, you don't have all of that going on. How, how would you know that this is sort of starting for you? Apart from the obvious hot flushes that we see reported everywhere, but are there other subtle symptoms? Yeah, so that's really that's really difficult. It's so it's so much easier, obviously, if you have someone who comes in saying, "We used to have a period once a month, and now I skip a month, or now they're more frequent, or there's a definite change in their cycle." It's obviously less clear in someone who has something like a marina coil, for example, or they're on a progestogen only pill, and that is artificially suppressing their menstrual flow, or uh, as you mentioned, in women who've had a hysterectomy. So for these women their ovaries are still functioning in the background and doing whatever they were going to do and when they get to perimenopause um i suppose something like obviously hot flushes and light sweats are a more obvious um objective thing that women can report but we often look out for worsening of what feels like pms which is a very i know a kind of frustratingly vague symptom to look for but you'd be surprised how obvious it is for some women and for the women when it's not totally apparent that's a good thing that they're not really symptomatic and that's a good thing in itself. But worsening of PMS, I suppose, is this combination of some physical symptoms and every woman listening to this knows these are my PMS symptoms. This is how I feel. And for some women that might be very mild and subtle, which is great. And for others, they know exactly what I'm talking about and they get the bloating and the breast tenderness. They get a menstrual headache or migraine and mood swings, mood and emotional symptoms. So they often worsen through perimenopause because of those fluctuations that we've talked about. So that volatile sort of choppy seas instead of just ripples creates an exaggerated version of PMS. For others, the mood and emotional symptoms can be really apparent as well. Like I have women who come in, they're 47, 48, you know, kind of very typical age. And they'll say, look, you know, I've nothing else going on, but my anxiety is crippling. And I've never had anxiety before. And it's the most strange experience to all of a sudden have it pop up at a point where you feel like you should be this kind of like confident shit together kind of adult and you're just not because this you know completely blindsides you so I think the only way like we can't completely put the onus on women and say it's up to you to decide if you're perimenopausal or not and then come in you come in and have a discussion if there's something that is bothering you and say lay it all out this is what's been going on. This is how I'm feeling. Look for a cyclical pattern. It comes and goes often. Chat through all of that with someone who's there to listen to you. And sometimes we don't know. Like some, like measuring these hormones is useless. So when you're trying to measure an FSH or an estrogen level, they're going up and down. It's not going to rule in or rule something out. So that's not helpful. So really it's about the discussion and about saying, what do we think the probability of this being you know these symptoms that you have that they're hormonal and then saying if they are hormonal how do you want to address them and then saying well it's trial and error like treat them and see how you get on often yeah. and that's it isn't it it's very very individualized and i suppose just as often we started our menstrual life very variable as well to you like we're going to end our menstrual life very variable as well and you know all those bits in between 
And I think that's one of the things that, you know, when you read some of the, the classic experiences of menopause, people don't realize they, they might not fit into that box, you know, and something as subtle, you know, um, as the anxiety, it's not subtle when you're experiencing it. But again, you, you didn't hear that talked about until very recently. And, you know, it's it's great to sort of see that now becoming a, a thing that we're starting to chat about it, that women are a lot more open about their experiences. Um, and I think that's, that's led to more honest and open conversations, not just between themselves, but also with their healthcare provider as well. And one of the things there that you've mentioned that is a real bugbear for me is is laboratory testing around that. Like, And, you know, I work in a hospital laboratory. We process thousands of samples every day. And uh, we get lots of hormone profiles for lots of different reasons. And I suppose, you know, can you take us through, um, obviously the, the hormone profiles are only very good in, in post-menopause if your FSH is, is a way up. But would you look for anything else during that time? Maybe the, like the B12, the vitamin D, is there anything else around that perimenopause period that would be important to rule out? Okay, so the people I do bloods for are under 45 and their periods have stopped completely. And we want to know why your periods have stopped at an age that isn't in an average age group. So we, we want to confirm that it's normal menopause, if you like, that it is failure of your ovaries, et cetera, whatever you want to term it. And so we would do an FSH, as you've mentioned, and we look for that to be raised. And then we repeat it at you know, at least a six week interval or more to confirm that if it is raised. So they're the women where an FSH is really helpful. And as you've mentioned, women over 45, then really it's not going to change anything. And if you come in saying, it's been a year since my last period, you're over 45 and you have classic symptoms and we're not worried about anything else. Me telling you your FSH is raised tells me nothing that your period is stopping hasn't told me. So that's frustrating because there is a lot of misinformation. And I think all the other bloods are are really based around the symptoms that someone is reporting. So obviously if someone's, you know, reporting really bad fatigue and there's like a myriad of reasons that can be and it's you know like obviously being awake with night sweats or just the poor sleep itself that comes with hormonal change and all these things but you know if there's fatigue there we'll we'll look at a thyroid profile we'll look at their ferritin their iron level we'll look to see if they're very heavy bleeding are they anemic we'll do a full blood count we do a b12 that's indicated we do um, we do celiac screening if someone is iron deficient and is fatigued. And so you have to go back to basic sort of, you know, biology and justify the tests that you're doing. So they're individual and there isn't, we don't have a blanket sort of battery test that we just throw at everyone. It, it, we listen to you. <laughs> we should be basing the tests on that. The other people just to mention it, who really shouldn't be having blood tests by and large are people on HRT who want their estrogen checked. So just be careful about that because estradiol as a blood test is really, um, is not hugely accurate. There's a really wide range in a normal menstrual cycle and there's no target. So if someone comes in saying, well, my estradiol is X, Y, or Z. I don't have a target. I'm not kind of wishing you were higher or lower or it's just not helpful. The only women where it is helpful is if you're on very high doses of transdermal estrogen. So that's the patch, the gel, the spray. We're giving you estrogen through your skin. There is a small percentage of women who aren't great at absorbing it through their skin because of the way their skin is, because of enzymes, because of how they're applying it, who knows. And if they're very symptomatic on a very high dose, that doesn't add up. And we want to know why. We might measure an estrogen for them. And that's the real value add of, of attending your doctor, isn't it? To get that, you know, wraparound service and to get that um, sort of very individualized diagnosis and individualized set of tests, because we do see people who are, you know, spending money on um, tests that they're picking up, um, you know, sort of over the counter in certain shops or in certain- Absolutely useless. If you're still having periods, don't do any, don't waste your money on anything over the counter. Don't do the Dutch testing. That's complete rubbish as well. So stick to- stuff where we kind of know what the range should be and we've some way of reliably interpreting it and if you're being charged up the wazoo like i know there's other testing the costs of the chicago tests and these things and and i'm just skeptical because they're so expensive they're being used in women who are vulnerable and just want an answer and so we're throwing good money at this stuff like it's you know you're vulnerable when you feel like that when you're desperate and you're symptomatic absolutely and you will pay anything to get answers and sometimes the simplest answers are in front of us you know like by again just by going through those symptom checklists by you know again speaking to her you know like your own gp or gynecologist a lot of the answers are there 
So you mentioned there a wee bit just around some of the, the treatments around transdermal estrogen and that. So can you take us through some of the options that we would have in that sort of perimenopausal and postmenopausal phase? And I suppose bearing in mind too that, you know, again, people with endometriosis or people who have adenomyosis and, you know, that fine balance between maybe flaring up symptoms or maybe, you know, it, like exacerbating that sort of, you know, very heavy bleeding or anything. So is there things that we need to be concerned about around that time as well? Yeah, I mean, in perimenopause, I suppose it's often hard to get your head around why we prescribe pink tree tea at all. Because if you think about it, on the one hand, we're saying, well, you're making too much estrogen and then I'm going to treat that by giving you more estrogen. But, and this is true for everyone, not just women with endometriosis. The, the theory is that a lot of that surge or overproduction of estrogen is in response to what your brain thinks is a dip that has preceded that. And if I can eliminate the dip and give you this kind of consistent baseline of estrogen, we get you back into a normal range. Your brain is happier. It's not reading things as being low or dipping at times. And so it's not then trying to correct that. So we remove that kind of pressure, that stimulus from your brain. And you always go back into a slightly more, you know, you still have a cycle and there's still ups and downs, but the range of that estrogen production is narrowed, which makes you feel better. That's the theory or at least the hope. So that's why we prescribe HRT. And then obviously in women, who are postmenopausal and their ovaries have stopped producing their own estrogen, it's a bit clearer. We're replacing, although not fully replacing, because it's much lower doses that we're using, but we're giving back a little bit of estrogen to put you above the threshold where you develop symptoms or health changes like bone density and loss and those kind of things. And for women with endometriosis, the key is to be careful about the balance of these two hormones. So we tend to not go in heavy handed with the estrogen that's going to be overly stimulating to any endometrial deposits that are there. And that's true whether you've had a hysterectomy or not. So we just tiptoe into the water and we go low dose with your estrogen. And the same with the progestin, you just need to make sure that you've adequate progestin on board. So HRT is a combination of those two hormones, the estrogen to make you feel better, ideally give you some health protection, the progestin to protect the lining of your womb from being overstimulated by the estrogen. There are standard minimum doses that we have to use of progestin. So everybody gets a certain amount because we know that's the amount that will protect them. And we sometimes increase that in women who have certain medical um, backgrounds that might make them higher risk, like a family history of endometrial cancer. Interestingly, as far as I'm aware, although you might correct me this, I don't think endometriosis does increase your risk of endometrial cancer. So that isn't considered risk. I'm just saying in general, we take all of these things into account. So the, the estrogen side of things, ideally we want to give it to you through your skin. There's estrogen tablets um, and they're fine. And we use them a little. Um, the preference for the kind of through your skin approach is really based on the fact that it won't carry the risk of blood clotting. So when you take estrogen by mouth, your liver produces more clotting proteins and that can increase your risk of getting a blood clot or stroke. And as you get older, that risk is going up anyway. And we just don't want to add to it. So dermal products, that's why there's all this buzz about using patches and a gel and a spray and those three things they are delivering the same hormone it's the same product but being delivered through a different vehicle that's all and one is not better than another i get asked all the time which is better should i be on the patch should i be on the care doesn't matter it's whatever suits you so some people find for them look the daily application of the gel that suits me and other people just prefer the twice weekly application of a patch or whatever it might be the spray is there too and for the progestin then i suppose if women have a history of having painful periods or heavy bleeding and it is concurrently bothering them like while i'm chatting to them that is an issue then we talk about a marina coil would be our best option so a marina coil can be used as protection for the lining of your womb um while you're on estrogen as part of your hrt so it kind of ticks a couple of boxes obviously it's very good at reducing down heavy painful bleeding it can be good for treating adenomyosis it's good contraception it's convenient. Don't have to remember to take it, which is usually handy. Um, so it ticks a lot of boxes and it we can use it for five years as part of your womb protection. And then there's other tablets and capsules and other things all containing progestin that we can use as well. It's a very long winded answer to your question, Kathleen. I'm sorry, but there's a broad spectrum of things that we can use. And really that's where the consultation comes in because then you're starting to individualize it. And then obviously there's the pill, like we do use the pill. And if for younger women, if they have endometriosis, if they have premature ovarian insufficiency, the pill has a place in this too. Not when you're older and certainly not when you're over 50. 
And it's it's great to have these choices now. You know, when, when we look back at, at some of the choices that were there for women maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, things have moved on so much. There's such a vast array of products. And, you know, when you, you hear women's experiences now, they appear to be tolerating them a lot better, which is so important because it leads to a lot more compliance and it leads to a lot more of a better outcome, I'm sure, as well for patients. And just to, uh, in terms of somebody will say who has the marina coil, you know, is that a sufficient amount of progesterone or would they need something like you know, maybe a progesterone pair on top of that or the outside? Go on, outside and talk. Oh, God, Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> My four year old gets, you know, you could probably talk about menopause. Yeah, but I see, this is it. Don't worry. She probably has he's <laughs> plenty of info. <laughs> Fine, say yes, you could say anyway. So, no, there is a, an adequate amount. It's quite rare that we give additional progestin with the marina coil. The most common situation where I would see that happen, I hesitate to say this because there's no guidance and like evidence to this, but very, very occasionally, if someone has a coil, we will give them micronized progesterone, or some people call it body identical progesterone, which is a type of progestin we'll often give on its own for as, as the progestin part of HRT. We might give it in addition to the coil um, because it has a bit of a sleep benefit. Now, it's not a sedative. It's not like a tranquilizer. It won't knock you out. But some women just find, look, you know, I was great when I was taking that body identical progesterone and now I've got a coil and my bleeding's all stopped and I feel fantastic, but my sleep has gone backwards and I was way better when I took it. And so we would double up. The issue with that is we're not 100% certain of what impact we have on breast cancer risk by doubling up these progestins. But intuitively, think we think it's probably small. And so case by case, if someone's low risk and they're attending screening and, all, and we discuss it with them, we may add it in. It's really unusual, though, to need additional progestin with a coil. Not unheard of, but not typical. And that, that brings us back to, you know, sort of conversations I have nearly every week with women. It's back to informed consent, isn't it? When you have that conversation, you know the risks, you know the benefits. And, you know, again... When you sort of open that dialogue to feeding back your side effects, maybe you're feeding back those symptoms to your GP because often, and I'm guilty of this myself, that you might go off with medication and it might not agree with you and you might come off it and maybe not feed back those reasons why. So I think it's very important to have that open conversation as well, isn't it? And say, look, you know, maybe the dose needs to be tweaked, maybe a particular formulation or maybe a particular brand doesn't suit. So I think there's always that sort of flexibility with, with medications as well. And I suppose... The other sort of side, we've mentioned estrogen and progesterone, which again, you know, we know are very important. Uh, we're being hit over the head very hard in the media, as social media, with testosterone. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, what's your feelings on testosterone? Meh. I just, I'm not impressed by it. Like, okay. I mean, like, I'm careful about what I say because there are definitely, anecdotally, we have women in the clinic who like for them it definitely works and I don't doubt it at all and I'm sure there's some placebo effect for some women but there's there's definitely women who come back saying I am better and my cognition is better and my libido is better and and so that's great and we're happy and it's very safe um we have really good safety data for using it for about two years even up to three where we don't think it has huge impact on statistical risk of developing things like breast cancer or blood clotting or, other things, or heart disease. So we're kind of comfortable with using it. It's usually a daily application of a gel onto your thigh. We do ask that people get blood tests um, initially six weeks after you start it, or ideally a baseline six weeks after you start it, give or take, and then every six months or so thereafter to make sure that your testosterone level is staying in what we consider to be a normal female range and not outside of that where we would see unwanted symptoms I currently sound like I'm taking heaps of too much testosterone because my voice is so deep and <laughs> so croaky but um so you can see changes and you can see deepening of the voice and it becomes irreversible which is a scary type side effect to have male pattern hair loss um clitoromegaly so enlargement to the clitoris acne can be a side effect and that's reversible but acne can be a side effect too so those things can happen but they're rare so we're quite comfortable at saying look if you're really interested in particular for low libido, that's where we have the evidence for using it. Try it, do it for three to six months. If you feel it's made no difference, dump it, I would say. Why are you on it then? There's no health benefit that we know of. You're getting more from um, normal, in inverted commas, HRT. Yeah, so like I think a lot of the research that's looked at it, most of it has come from the Southern Hemisphere actually, and it's not impressive. Mm -hmm. But 
we're open-minded because we don't want to miss those few people who do get benefit from it and because it's very low risk but I'm not chucking at people as they walk in the door like I'm not I'm I'm talking people out of it more than I'm putting people on it I'd say the only because I feel like what's the point in adding in an extra thing on your prescription or paying for something extra if I don't think it's going to have any role in this particular situation you know and have you seen any evidence for um, the use of testosterone in that way to help reduce maybe chronic pain and chronic pelvic pain in particular in, in those with um, endometriosis? I have not seen any strong evidence for that. I have heard a lot of anecdotal cases. But... That's really interesting. No, I am not aware of at the moment any large randomized controlled trial that would be convincing like good high quality evidence for using it for that purpose. So no is my short answer. The one kind of demographic, like the one kind of area of women who may benefit from testosterone is younger women who've had oophorectomy. So if you've had your both of your ovaries removed, we know that after about two years, if we come back and look up your testosterone level, on average for these women, they'll be about 50% below women of a similar age who haven't gone through surgery. So you can kind of make an argument that they, you know, they would be more likely to have benefit from going on testosterone. So we're a bit keener to put them on, but again, only if it's indicated. But no, I'm not familiar with any studies that have, that have, that are large, that are convincing, that are high quality for using it for pain. But look, that can change. That's it. And unfortunately, like as we know, and there's very little high quality research out there in terms of endometriosis as it is. Um, you know, haven't took part in the the, the extra guidelines and we struggled to get high quality research for most of the it's women's health it's crazy it's general. Like, yeah. it really is like we're, we're this far into 2024 we're still in sort of you know yeah no randomized control trials no good data and you know that's it's it's frustrating it is changing it's changing very slowly but it is frustrating um but I must have got on. We've got to go off on a tangent now, and you don't want me to go <laughs> rant because we'll never get finished. I don't. <laughs> but in terms of patriarchy, Kathleen, the piece. Oh, don't, don't. I, I can do you see the suppression of my head? Um, in terms of, I'm just thinking of our community as well, too, who have, you know, um, spent a lot of time in menorrhea due to either hormonal suppression or, you know, um, some again who've gone into maybe premature um, ovarian insufficiency like due to maybe like repeated surgeries or, you know, treatment or for an unknown reason. And for some people, we know that, that HRT is going to be a very good solution. And for some people, they may not want to go down that road. So, you know, as a GP, like if patients come to you, you know, what else can you offer us that, you know, that would help in that situation? Yeah, I think... There, that's a group of women who often I think we fall short of helping properly. So I think women who've had oophorectomy and women who are on gonadotrophin, you know, GnRH agonists. So they're on medication that is completely suppressing their ovaries, and they are just, as you say, plunged into menopause, like thrown off a cliff into menopause, and told, "Well, look, we've helped your endometriosis, so good luck with everything else." And I have seen recently, I have seen someone in exactly that situation and I can't remember exactly what age she was, but like early forties, way too young to be, I mean, you're never, you know, there's never an age where it's appropriate, but just the thought of just saying to someone like, but by now, you know, I've completely shut down your ovaries. And so I've tried to fix your endometriosis so that you should just be grateful for that. (laughs) And so she had fixed one, well, improved one problem and was then left with, crippling night sweats hot flushes she couldn't cope with her mood was all over the place and so on really bad vaginal dryness all of which was having a huge impact on her relationship her ability to work her quality of life just enjoying her life in general and she felt i I should be so grateful that these other symptoms are slightly better i I shouldn't really do anything that would upset that or reach out for help anyway these women in general like there's a lot of evidence we can reassure women that with add back hrt so giving a small amount of estrogen back doesn't seem to undo the benefit that you've had from having your ovaries removed or going on a medication to suppress your ovaries. So we should be able to find a balance of suppressing the side effects and still getting the benefit of the medication you're on, hopefully. And it isn't even like touching on long-term health, like the impact that's going to have on your heart disease risk and your bone density risk, especially if you're under 45, shutting off your ovaries. So you have to take that into account. So we we would come at us from a 
like obviously there's a holistic approach and talking about lifestyle and focusing on long-term health and a Mediterranean diet and being active and reducing absolutely actual like hypocrisy reducing your caffeine and your alcohol but anyway my glass of wine <laughs> and but you know in general all the things we know we should be doing and not doing um and then but other things like vitamin d and looking at things like balance and core strength and really trying to promote someone's long-term you know risk of falls and bone density and, and looking at that now before the horse is bolted so that takes a bit of time that's a conversation in itself and then in terms of symptomatic management obviously it comes back to what the symptoms are that you're trying to manage and we have very good non-hormonal medications that have an impact on hot flushes and night sweats but also have an impact on mood so we use antidepressants they have a role and for some women they are really beneficial and they shouldn't be made feel stigmatized because they're on a medication that makes them feel better. Um, so they have a role. And then we have some other medications. There's a bladder medication. Um, there's a really old-fashioned blood pressure medication. There's a couple of others that we can use for controlling what we think are um, menopausal symptoms or uh, in particular hot flushes and night sweats. There's even a new medication, um, which hopefully will hit the markets here or hit the pharmacies in April, called Fezolinotent, which acts on the brain. So it's centrally acting on your um hypothalamus on the part of your brain that's actually you know controlling your thermostat and and is responsible for why we get hot flushes and night sweats so it doesn't have any impact on estrogen receptors and it would be really safe for women who want to avoid estrogen for example perfect so that's it's great to have those options as well too because you know again like we mentioned earlier like not every drug suits every person and I'm going to take you back to, to one of my sort of um, hot topics, and that's the use of GNRHA, particularly in, in very young women. Um, and it's changed over the years in that we've got a little bit more sensible in its use. Um, and I'm not seeing as many women losing their ovaries in their 20s, which is an absolute relief. Um, and we're starting to see that 30, 30 age group as well, too. That's starting to, to decrease quite a lot, which is good. Um, bone density. Should women have bone density and um, DEXA scans done prior to start the GNRHA? Do you think there's a benefit in that? Or do you think it's enough just to follow the lifestyle advice for, for healthy bones during that time? I think we should be careful. It, so number one, DEXA is radiation. So there, it's not completely risk-free, although it's very small radiation. Like, you know, so we're comfortable with using it, but just, you know, it's not completely risk-free. But I think the bigger issue is that the younger you are, we don't use a thing called a T score when you do your DEXA if you're under the age of 45, if you're under the age of 50, actually. Um, and the T score is a bit more accurate. And so basically, the younger you are, the harder it is to interpret a DEXA and the less accurate it is. So that can be challenging and misleading for women. And the other thing I would say is that so a DEXA is an X ray, obviously, as you know, in measuring your bone density, which is grand, but all the information it's giving you is just bone density. It's not telling you anything about bone quality and those other risk factors for falls, which are really important too. So it's only one little piece of a much bigger jigsaw about your long-term risk of developing a hip fracture or a lumbar fracture or something else. So I think people can become overly focused on the specific score they got on their DEXA and then they're trying to improve that with their necks. So you just have to be careful about that's a slippy slope, you know. Um so we try to avoid doing them um if we can. But there are exceptions to that. And I think if you are completely shutting down someone's ovaries and in particular if they risk factors for bone density loss. So if we have family history if somebody smokes, if they're celiac, if they're diabetic, if they've been on steroids for a long time, all that kind of list of things that we know about. Um, then it is probably worth doing a baseline because it gives you some information. I just think you need to be careful about who you dive in with. And I mean, in a perfect world, it would be women over the age of 40 getting DEXs and not women under the age of 40. But there's nuance there, like everything. Yeah, we're just careful with them. So no, we're not doing them across the board just because somebody wants it or because they're worried or yeah, it takes a bit of counselling. It's like anything else. Yeah, and that makes sense. And again, we're back to that very individualized jigsaw that we have when it comes to to health and in particular women's health as well. We have a lot more pieces, I think, scattered around the ground and we try to start looking at things, don't we? You bring in all the, the endo and adenocide on top of that as well. So in terms then of, you know, the risks associated with menopause, like we, we see sensationalist headlines sometimes around 
the risks of not taking HRT, the risks if we do take HRT. Can you take us through some of those risks? Yeah, and there's risks on both sides of the fence, and that's important to know. So I'm not, I don't, like, I'm not a HRT doctor, and I think a lot of people come in thinking that I'm going to be like pushing HRT on them, and we don't. And I think sometimes people are surprised at that. I think, you know, like we're saying about taxes, like there's there's balance to be had, and it's you know it's it is individual. So the bottom line really is that if you look at the downsides of hormone therapy, so why wouldn't you go on it? So, I mean, number one, don't go on something if you don't know why you're on it. So you need to know why you're taking X, Y, or Z. So if you're someone who is 50 and you still have your ovaries and your periods have stopped and you feel fantastic and you have, you know, no reason to think that you're really high risk for osteoporosis and everything is going swimmingly, leave well enough alone, I think. So we're not saying, look, HRT should be given to women across the board. The downside really is that there's health risk and then there's side effects. So on a day-to-day basis, it's the side effects that bothers us and the patients more than the health risk because the risk is small. The side effects really are like the big bothersome one is bleeding. So a lot of women come back with difficulty with bleeding. And I suppose it's something that you might want to pay more attention to in somebody with adenomyosis because they're just higher risk to have a bit of breakthrough bleeding anyway. Um, And similarly with, you know, someone who has a history of endometriosis, you want to just tread carefully, that's all. So, um, so that's an issue and the bleeding in itself isn't dangerous, but will lead someone down a path of often needing an ultrasound, a pelvic exam, which, you know, not everybody, okay, I was going to say not really likes having a pelvic, nobody likes having a pelvic exam. Like we shouldn't be doing pelvic exams unless we have to, they're invasive, they're uncomfortable for women, but they're important. But anyway, we're exposing women to extra need to have one of them and an ultrasound and so on if they have bleeding. And that's a risk factor with HRT um, all the way up to having a hysteroscopy, like a camera test and, and so on. And all of that is invasive and unpleasant. So there's that. There's other side effects. People get breast tenderness and headache and bloating. Weight gain isn't a side effect that we're conscious of, although I get asked about that all the time. It's considered to be pretty weight neutral, but there's always the 1% who probably will get some weight gain with HRT and that's a possibility and then there's a lot of chopping and change and you know that progestin didn't suit me but this one did and that one didn't and there's shortages of the one that suited me and all of that you're just it's an extra complication in your life so there's that and then in terms of risk the medical risk with hormone therapy so the the big one is breast cancer because that's the thing that everybody thinks of and they think of hormone therapy and they're right there is a small risk of breast cancer with combination hrt and it is important to differentiate that Women who've had a hysterectomy, who have no history of endometriosis, will often take estrogen on its own because there's no endometrial type tissue anywhere to protect anymore. And women who take estrogen on its own, they have a they have a lower risk of breast cancer with their HRT. It's not zero, although it depends on what study you're reading, but it's probably not zero, but it's really small. Women with combination HRT, so they're on the estrogen progestin, either because they still have a womb or they've had a hysterectomy and have endometriosis. And we want to protect that kind of, you know, glandular, like the endometrial type tissue that remains potentially. So we give them combination HRT. So there is a small increased risk of HRT over the age of 50. A small increased risk of breast cancer over the age of 50 to the tune of about three or four extra breast cancers. So additional breast cancers per thousand women who take five years of hormone therapy. So it's not a large number, but if you get diagnosed with breast cancer, you will ask yourself, was it because of my HRT? Which is why I go back to saying, you need to know why you were on it. And you should be on it because you're treating symptoms or because you have osteoporosis. No other reason. So we try and veer away if we can from putting people on it just because they've heard about the reduction in cardiovascular risk. And that is also true. So there is really good evidence that women who start HRT within 10 years of their last period will have a small reduction in their long-term risk of heart attack and stroke, cardiovascular risk. That on its own doesn't outweigh some of the negatives. Like that's where it gets really complicated. And I worry a little that in the next 10 years, we will be telling women something different and we will be telling them you should take it for cardiovascular protection. And if that's the case, then so be it. But at this minute in time, they are not the guidelines. Um, and you know, if you're taking it to reduce dementia risk, we've even less evidence for that. So you need to be more careful, 
Um, so yeah, you should be on it for symptom control, treatment of osteoporosis, and then be aware of the fact that there's a small increased risk of breast cancer and it's duration dependent. The longer you're on it, the more impactful it is on your risk of breast cancer. Some women will continue to get more benefit than risk for life and they stay on HRT for life. And that is fine as well. So it just depends on the person what else do I need to say about that? The progestin, the, the thing we're using to protect your womb, it actually dictates some of the, the um, breast cancer risk. So modern HRT, we try to use what we consider to be more breast friendly type of progestins as well. That's the thing. It's, it's um, again, we're back to individualization, aren't we? And I think with risk factors, and certainly in terms of breast cancer, other cancers as well, and cardiovascular disease, there are a lot of other factors that go into that. And maybe a lot of other factors that we have a little bit more control over. We don't have control over genetic, we don't have control over family history. But if we're aware of them and then maybe our lifestyle factors, you know, such as smoking or alcohol, lack of exercise, you know, maybe diet, like there's plenty of things that we can sort of moderate around that as well, isn't there, to help offset that risk. And I think that risk calculation is probably something that you need to have that very strong conversation with if, if you're trying to weigh up, you know, maybe treatment, you know, versus no treatment, you know, that's a mm. conversation really to have, isn't it, with your doctor as well to see, you know, where that risk lies and where you lie on that sort of scale as well. Yeah, that that's extremely individual and that changes with time, you know, so it's a moving goalpost because where you are, which side of that risk benefit fence you're on now may be different in five years, which is why we see you, oh, you know, once or twice a year continually because the conversation should evolve and keep up with what you're doing not everybody needs to be on HRT for life and some women after a few years will taper their estrogen and their symptoms do not return and they do a DEXA at that point their bone density is normal and we would say look I don't see the problem with you stopping it because I can't see why you're on it and nor can they and they're happy and then as I said there's definitely women for whom that's not the case and they want to continue it for life and we totally support them with that so it's case by case, like anything. Yeah. No wonder our consultations are long. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing. Like, you know, you need, you need at least an hour, an hour and a half, like with every patient at that rate, you know, to go through mm. everything, you know. But I think two patients are becoming a little bit more informed. We're going in maybe, I'm hoping we're going in with summaries to you now, maybe of things, whereas we've been in with the 10 page booklets before. Um, I think the role of patient advocates has probably helped in that as well too, to maximize. 100%. Yeah. You know. And I think that's very good because if I only have 10 minutes with my GP and I know she's patients either side of me, I want to give her the priority. I want to give her the wee bullets, you know, and just say, right, this, 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 what can we do? Okay, that's it. And if it warrants a longer conversation, then we, we will have to have that. But I think, you know, again, we're back to that open communication and certainly over for my time, the thousands of women I've spoken to over the years that there's a lot of shame and a lot of stigma and a lot of fear around endometriosis symptoms menopausal symptoms and even that fear of even discussing bleeding and that's always a thing too that you know um you, you sort of come across women sort of that late 40s early 50s when they go through that sort of trickling and flooding and that sort of heavy bleeding that comes at that time as well too and they go into they go into panic mode they go into fear mode as well too because again like you've mentioned there can be a lot of reasons for heavy bleeding and they don't necessarily maybe want to investigate those risks. But aside from something like the marina, are there any other medications or any other things that could be done once, um, you know, it's been, there's been no sinister causes, you know, for, for the bleeding, if it is down to adenomyosis or endometriosis, are there other things that women can take to help? Yeah, I mean, we'd use, we'd try to start with something non-hormonal altogether if we can. So I think, again, that depends on what someone can take and the severity of their symptoms, et cetera. But like starting with something like tranexamic acid, which is a sort of anti-bleeding type medication um, or cyclocaprin is the other name for that or constant methanolic acid, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So it's a bit like nerf, um, ibuprofen, but not ibuprofen um, or nerofen. It's, it's a kind of cousin of that. And it has an effect, like a vascular effect on the lining, the tiny little blood vessels that are feeding the lining of the womb. Um, and it's also good pain relief. So I find constant methanolic acid really helpful. Sometimes we use both. So you can use the two concurrently. So you can use tranexamic acid as well. And there are medications that are taken as you need them. So they're not taken throughout the month. They're taken just, you know, three to five days per month on average. And they don't necessarily stop bleeding 
but they will reduce it significantly and they can really reduce, reduce the pain that is associated with it. So that can be handy. There's an oral contraceptive pill, which we use, again, depending on the person. Like, you know, if I have somebody who's younger, um, if, like I don't, it's not just menopause, you know. And so if I have somebody who's younger and she's looking for birth control, you know, then you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. Um, we lean towards with the COCP, with the oral contraceptive, not taking a break from it because we don't have to make women have a period every month. It's so ridiculously old fashioned. So can take it continuously, get rid of your bleeding. There's some women who don't like that approach and would rather have a period. I think it just like psychological, isn't it? You feel more like this is normal. This is what I'm used to. And you can allow for that too. It's fine. But, um, and then, you know, using progestins, there's different type of progestins out there. It can be tricky often to find one that really suits you. Sometimes they're, it's often we blame for progestins for causing all of the side effects with HRT and the pill. And there's truth to that, I think. But anyway, so there can be a bit of dancing around finding one that suits you, but they can be helpful. Um, and then it's not just the marina coil. Like we have other um, progestin releasing coils that are lower dose. Now they're not, they're no good for HRT. They won't protect your womb from estrogen if you're on HRT, but if you're younger and you're just looking for birth control, they can be fantastic too. If I left anything out, there's Danazol, there's the GnRH agonists. Yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm just, like straight from the bottom of the barrel here. <laughs> like, um, what else do we use? Oh, the other thing we use in menopause a little bit for women with endometriosis and for add back is Livio or Tibolum, yeah, which I think is like for Tibolum. Mm -hmm. Tibolon is like, Tibolon is, is sort of, you know, has no mates standing in the corner of the party, totally forgotten about. So Tibolon is a synthetic steroid. And I think maybe because we often open the conversation by saying Tibolon is a synthetic steroid, people run screaming for it. It just sounds awful. But all that means is like, Tibolon isn't estrogen. Actually, if anything, it is probably more in common with the progestin, but it's not estrogen. It's not progestin. It's not testosterone. But it's a compound or a molecule that interacts with those receptors in your body. So your breast tissue and brain and, you know, all of you, those estrogen receptors, if you're taking Livial as the brand name, Tivolon is the actual medication, they get switched on like putting a key in a lock as if you're on estrogen. And the same with the progestin receptors in your womb. So it's quite good at switching on, like activating all those progestin receptors as if you've taken a progestin and it has a really weak effect on testosterone receptors which is often worth a try you know it's also really good for compliance because you just have to take a tablet a day it's a very strict word and its impact on breast cancer and its impact on bone density and its impact on blood clotting is the same as our safe forms of hrt until the age of 60 and then we're looking to switch people off Livial and onto something else, small increased risk of stroke over 60. So that's why we do that. But other than that, it's considered to be really breast friendly. It's still giving you your bone benefit. It's, so, you know, it, like I said, it's kind of really now made to the corner, but it's really, <laughs> actually really helpful. Livial. It is. It's funny because I haven't, you know, I haven't heard, see, or heard or seen much conversation about it in a while. And it was the real go to for people who were on GNRHA for a long time. And in particular, you know, it's all Um, There was a lot of studies done with that and, you know, compliance was very good and, and, you know, people did find benefits from, you know, all those sort of side effects, you know, the hot flushes, the vaginal dryness, you know, the sort of bone pain and that that came along with taking the GNRHA, particularly over a long period of time. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of, as you know, a lot of patients are prescribed them for, you know, longer than the, the license period as well too. So the use of HRT was advanced and the back was very important at that time. I suppose, you know, when we're chatting then about, um, you know, the typical and then we sort of go off then away from the direct hormonal side and into the aromatase inhibitors. Mm. Um, is that something that you see used a lot or is that like a real special case? Because again, there's a, again, small enough evidence for their use in endometriosis within a very specific group. Um, would you see that like much in your practice for, for treatment? So I would see them used commonly as part of post breast cancer treatment. So that's where we would see the aromatase inhibitors used more now and in fertility. So I would have kind of had familiarity with using them in fertility. I might see less of it, I suppose, in the endometriosis patients, but then I'm probably not seeing the endometriosis patients who end up on something like an aromatase inhibitor or probably under the care of a hospital-based gynecologist at that point. And they essentially work by switching off your ability to make your own estrogen at all. They're really, they're, that door is shut and there is no estrogen and they're tough and we like women are extremely symptomatic on them 
are women who've had breast cancer who then go, if they've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, may go on an aromatase inhibitor. And it's a real kick in the teeth because you've survived your breast cancer, the shock of the breast cancer diagnosis, all the trauma that comes with that, whatever treatments they've had up to that point. And then they get like a foot on their throat with like, we're just going to squeeze the last bit of quality of life out of you with an aromatase inhibitor. However, on the other hand, they're used because they do improve recurrence rates. So they're not being used out of cruelty. They're being used because there's an evidence base for using them. Um, but they can be tricky to manage. So we would use a lot of the non-hormonal medications like the SSRIs and SR, the antidepressants we talked about, or oxybutynin, which is the bladder medication and so on, that kind of category for treating some of the side effects, the menopausal side effects. And the same would be true for women with endometriosis on an aromatase inhibitor. The issue is you can't give out that k for those women. Yep. And it's, it's again, it's a tricky balance when you have that, that sort of history of breast cancer, breast cancer treatment as well. Um, the one recently published paper around the use of vaginal estrogen in um, patients who've had um, breast cancer, history of breast cancer. Um, how do you feel about that? What do you think? Yeah, about it? flash it in, give it to everyone. Yeah, everyone, That's everyone should be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, the, I mean, it's confusing for patients because like the word estrogen is there. And if you've been told you've estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, now I'm going to give you tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor or something that will make sure you never have any estrogen anywhere near a breast cell ever again. And then I'm talking about giving you estrogen. It just, it sounds very counterintuitive. And again, the same with, you know, if people have very severe endometriosis and they're being told that everything about estrogen is bad, it's not. And with localized estrogen, we have different, there's, you know, a couple of different types of pessary and there's a cream. And they're the products that are available in Ireland at the moment. They are really localized. So that's the difference. We don't consider that to be HRT at all. So localized vaginal estrogen, usually it's an application every night for the first two or three weeks, depending on the product, and then down to maybe twice or three times a week long term. And if you go and measure someone's blood estradiol level, um, you know, after they've started these vaginal estrogens and you follow them up, you'll see a small peak in estrogen in the first few weeks that then falls back down to baseline. That's been consistently replicated in absolutely enormous studies. So we have huge confidence in telling women it is really safe to be on vaginal estrogen. It shouldn't have an impact on endometriosis. It shouldn't have an impact on breast cancer risk. Go for it. And the problem with, with vaginal dryness and painful sex and bladder symptoms and all those genital urinary symptoms that occur because of low vaginal estrogen levels they, they get worse. A lot of your menopausal symptoms improve with time. Brain fog, the one that I think is more, way more impactful than hot flushes and night sweats. So changes in cognition, like verbal fluency and memory and those things. Although a very impactful symptom, at least I can tell women, look, even if we did nothing and we put you on nothing and you just have to wait it out, I'm backed up by a body of evidence that over time, this will come back to baseline. I can't give you a timeline and it'll be awful potentially while you're waiting for things to improve, but it will improve. Whereas with vaginal, I hate the word atrophy, but anyway, with vaginal changes related to low estrogen, it is going to get worse and it will just be there for a life and it will never fix itself. And so treat it, treat it, treat it, treat it and treat it early because it's so much easier to prevent it than fix it. Yeah. That's awesome. I'll die on this hill. I'll be, up this I'll be up there with you because it's one of those things if you see in women with you know like severe vaginal dryness or they're having recurrent UTIs or they're just they're really suffering you know and it's just go and have that conversation um the only place for vaginal estrogen shouldn't be is on your face like the tiktokers so <laughs> <laughs> I have a funny story but that's correct but now is not the time so somebody... <laughs> you're gonna tell me you've tried this and it's worked don't you <laughs> I wait till you stop recording and then I'll this <laughs> yeah. But I suppose one, one last question for you before we do wrap up. And we all love a bit of woo. We all sort of, you know, we read, we read all sorts of, you know, things online and we hear that if we, you know, stand in the garden at two in the morning, a pair of orange deckers, we're going to feel better. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the 1% theory, you know, if it, if it makes you feel good and it doesn't do any harm, give it a go. Absolutely. But we hear a lot about hormone balancing. And it's one of those things that wrecks my head because if we are cyclical by nature and we know that our hormones are cyclical even within a day or an hour, um, 
how rubbish is hormone balance and is there any truth in, in that at all? Like, you know, is there any supplement or food or wonder drug that's going to balance my hormones? <laughs> Depends what you mean by balance. That's not a med- like it's just not a medical term. So I totally agree. And if you look at the absolute chaos that is a normal menstrual cycle, there's no balance. Like your estrogen, it's not even like we do this when we're talking about estrogen. For, like we do a kind of like an like an upside like a upside down U shape, right? We do like a bell curve for estrogen. Now that's what it does. It doesn't do that actually. In reality, if you really dive into it, it's more like an M shape. But then if you go into it even deeper, it's completely chaos. Like, and that's a normal menstrual cycle. And then you've progestin and you've testosterone and they're all doing different. Well, testosterone is not affected by your actual menstrual cycle, I should point out. But certainly with estrogen and progestin, they fluctuate hugely. And even month to month in someone in their 30s having regular ovulation, perfectly 28 day cycle or the rest. If you actually got into it and measured their blood levels every day, if you could do that accurately, you'd see a lot of chaos happening in the background. So you know, balance of what, I suppose, is, you know, and I kind of buy in a little to like, well, we need, in someone who has a womb, I know I need to give them a certain amount of progestin to stop them getting womb cancer, like to bring down their rate, their risk of womb cancer sufficiently. And that will vary depending on the amount of estrogen they're on, because the more estrogen I give them, there's a point, a threshold is passed. I have to give them a bit more progestin. That's the only balance that I can think of. And outside of that, no, I don't. I mean, I think in terms of aiming for a healthy diet in general, that's good. And we should all be doing that and eating more, you know, your nuts and seeds and and vegetables and fruit and, you know, kind of steering away from um, meat and all of that, I think is just generally healthy anyway. I'm not sure what impact it really has on hormones specifically though. And then the only other thing would be phytoestrogens, which are those plant derived estrogens like flaxseed and soy and tofu. And I think there is evidence that they can be helpful and certainly they're very safe. And anecdotally, some women find them great. So I think go for it. They're part of a healthy diet anyway. I think if you're really symptomatic, like if you're absolutely in the trenches and you come in on your hands and knees, me telling you to go home and take phytoestrogens, isn't helpful or if you've osteoporosis i'm not helping you you'd need a bathtub full of flaxseed to have any impact on your bones so like they're helpful for women who have mild symptoms that are otherwise manageable and just want an extra bit of a uh, something or other but yeah so I, there's no such thing as balancing your hormones so what that mean? and the yeah. thing is we're, we're you know complex organisms we are in a state of flux all the time no matter what it is you know every hormone every enzyme everything is constantly changing in our body so it makes no sense to try and stabilize something at one point at all you know and you know the fiery students is very interesting because they got a huge amount of bad press in the endometriosis community for a long number of years and you know people were like you know like you take soy and take every you know fiery student out of your diet and this was this inverted commas endo diet which had people you know on borderline disordered eating i think at, at a lot of stages as well too which is very very problematic um and it is one of those things where it's more the variety of things it's letting the mix of mm. things that's important you know like have a little bit of everything that, that is good for you you know and, and you know don't overdo anything like same with same with everything isn't like any form of exercise or any form of anything you can overdo it. You can even overdo the wine. I've been told, but I have to get to that <laughs> point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but we. But it's a sense of control, isn't that it? Like I think if you tell someone with endometriosis who has struggled to find decent answers and guidance, yeah. they start. It's like we were talking. Obviously, they were saying where people are like the te- the blood tests that are really expensive. You start to look for control like okay well i can fix it and if i just do this things will get better and i have control over the situation and telling people to do that with diet and i'm like i'm all for a ba- like balance your diet not your hormones type you know and all for a healthy diet and all that stuff but just i think it is a sense of control and if i just cut all the stuff out that will fix this problem and maybe in a small percentage it does and then i hate the fact that it almost attributes guilt or blame that if you come in and you're still symptomatic and we see this with weight gain and obesity, like people living in bigger bodies and people living with obesity, that there's a huge amount of like blame. Well, it must be that you're not doing the right diet and the right amount of exercise. And that's been completely debunked. And so the same thing, if, you know, then what do you do if you're the 
the person with bad endometriosis symptoms and you have done all of this perfect diet, then what? You know, it's the assumption where you're just not doing it enough or you're not, you know, that's not fair either. So you just can't control everything, unfortunately. But you can see how people buy into that. I totally get why people go down that route. Absolutely. And look, believe me, at three in the morning when you're literally wanting to, you know, go down and get a knife and cut half your organs out, you know, you will try anything. And I've been there and, you know, like I'm a scientist, I should be able to discern between what's good and bad evidence. But you will, you'll sort of go, oh, if I just try that, that might work, you know. I could be something as silly as a pair of orange knickers, but you will try it. But yeah, it is, it is back to that patient control and patient choice again. And I think, you know, it's sort of back to the focus of patient advocacy, isn't it? To make sure that we're giving them um, good information, accurate information, um, information that they can use that's been broken down from the scientific literature into something that's usable that they can then take to their healthcare professional um, and they could also then use that to evaluate other things. So maybe acupuncture is very good at de-stressing you and reducing the pain. Maybe you might see a registered dietitian who can give you, you know, very individualized professional advice or our favorite person in the community is the pelvic physio. Yeah. So, like there's, you know, you have lots of things that you can pull together to make the, the, the perfect treatment, but you can still have a flare up with all that. And, you know, that's that's when other management comes in. And that's, I suppose we could have a whole other conversation on, on, on pain management as well too, like and on all the, the options that are out there. It's it's endless, isn't it? And we probably talk a lot in managing period pain when actually it's not just mm-hmm. confined to the three or four days a month or five or six, like, and it's month long. And I think that gets lost in translation a lot at our level, I think a little. Yeah. You know, that that's... It's the complexity of the pain as well, too, because yeah. you may have that really bad surge, maybe mid-cycle and during the actual period itself, but you may have that low line, sort of low back pain or maybe pelvic pain because all maybe the rest of the month as well that needs to be managed. And, you know, like a lot of the times, you know, people resort maybe to hot water bottles, TENS machine or, you know, things like dietary changes as well, too. Anything that sort of will help, you know. But again... I suppose we're, we're back to that sort of same thing again. Your GP has options for you. They're the person who has, you know, all the answers. If they don't have the answers, they will be able to refer you to somebody who does and they'll be able to find somebody who can help you. Um, you know, and, and certainly I know, you know, we tend to lay blame at, you know, um, physicians for not recognizing endometriosis early enough. We have a long delayed diagnosis of Ireland, same as the rest of the world. But equally, I've seen a huge shift in that in the last number of years. And where the bottleneck is, is where GPs recognize it and acknowledge it and are able to do the medical management very, very well. And that's, you know, reflected in the extra guidelines as well. You can do your presumptive diagnosis without surgery and then referring. But we're finding, of course, the referral pathway is very difficult because our mm-hmm. gynecology services in every hospital in the country is backed up forever because it's often one of the first services to get cancelled. So... We are making progress. I'm like, say, 25 years experience of observing this and being in the middle of it. And, you know, it's slow progress, but we are making progress. And it's thanks to people like yourself, Kiva, who have taken such a strong interest in women's health. You're very generous with your time and your knowledge. Every time I hear you speak, I learn something more. And like this evening as well, too, like it's, it's been a great education. And I just want to thank you for giving up your time and I uh, really appreciate well, it. Right back at you, Kathleen. Like, I'm, you know, Look at everything. Anyway, look at everything you've achieved. This could turn into a serious mutual appreciation contest here. But like, just, you know, this wouldn't exist. I can't do this on my own. So um, like, and same thing every time I hear you speak and I have, and I listened to actually the previous Jared podcasts and it was like, oh, I didn't know what, it's really interesting. And hearing the patient voice outside of the actual clinical setting is actually really interesting as well. So it's, you know, it's important that we come at this from all these angles and hear voices from many different aspects and walks of life. So, you know, right back at you. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Darg and we'll chat to you all again soon. Bye.